Excellent work, Julianne. Um, <laughs> you're just really, once again, um, I marvel at the uniqueness of each of these entries, uh, each of these full-length entries. Uh, you know, I mean, how can it be that uh, somebody requests a reinterpretation of, <clears throat> of somebody's music or somebody's artwork and receives such individual takes on it. I think, you know, perhaps only in orchestration, where there are so many variables and the, you know, the, the art um, is so personal that we see something with this much variety and uh, this much uh, individ individuality of expression. And, and it's just really great being able to see everybody grow, develop, and... Um, you know, uh, perfect their sense of craft and so on. And there certainly is a lot of great stuff in here. Uh, let's flip back so that we can start at the beginning of E, as you might know if you've been watching some of these evaluations, Julianne. Uh, I'm starting them sort of backwards, taking a look at the last section first, <laughs> and then the D section, and then A through C. <clears throat> so, just a few observations here. Um, you take out some of your wins right in here, and we'll, we'll we're, of course, we're going to study D in a, in a few minutes, or 20 minutes, possibly. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, <laughs> that you know, the brass just really sound um, boisterous here, and there's a kind of almost a rankness to the, uh, to their, to their sound, and it, uh, you know, like, the overtones are just creating this raucous effect in the um, in the playback in the mock-up, but you you know you hold to the you hold to the um, the general sense of what's going on in the piano score. I'm just flipping forward to it. Um, <clears throat> all argando and non decrescendo, right? So you're you're keeping. You're keeping this loud and then fading out at the end. Um, I don't think it would hurt, <clears throat> just to kind of to comment here in general for everybody. I don't think it would hurt anything for for there to be non decrescendo marked in any of these parts. Just you know, just for reference for the um, for the conductor. And I don't think you need to say ritardando on top of all argando. The I think the implication is clear. You know, that there will be a broadening right in here. Um, which, you know, which in itself, you know, just just as um, you are using morendo to also mean a, um, a diminution of, of tempo, as well as, uh, as well as dynamics. Here, you know, all argando and a broadening can also be interpreted as a as a a growing sense of of fullness to the dynamic, right? As as interpreted in many many you know by many many performers. I think that the the diminuendo it's a little. Like you know, here you have the you're you're going diminuendo to pianissimo past the rest. I wouldn't do that. I would have the, I would have the markings end at the rest and just put the pianissimo under the rest or before the rest. Okay, and then here, <clears throat> if you really want, uh, as it as it seems, if you want this bassoon note 
to diminuendo to pianissimo by the middle of the bar, I think you should do a, um, I think you should break it up. You know, you know something, it's, it's a little strange. Like here you have diminuendo to pianissimo at um, like three quarters of a bar of the way through. Yeah, so it seems maybe copy paste or there's some sort of global, um, you know, global setting for dynamics like this so that they ended up going past the rest. Okay, so watch out for that. Or did you mean that you should fade away, you know, all parts should fade away by this time? Uh, so just, yeah, it would it become confusing for the conductor. But I would say, you know, both here in your viola part and the doubling part in bassoon, if you really intend to fade away by the middle of the bar or by the three quarter of the bar, then you should do it with ties, right? So that the so that the players know exactly when they should get to pianissimo. Same thing with your uh, first violin here. Yeah, I'm not so sure that you need to lose the first violin halfway through. In the uh, in the piano score, um, it the you know both octaves kind of stay at play. If anything needs to be needs to end early, I would think that it possibly would be the violas, right? Because that way, um, the the rising line doesn't cross, you know, doesn't uh, it doesn't run up to the viola line. There's a there's a slight gap so that the note can restart uh, with a new voice in the next bar. All right. So, anyways, but it's it doesn't hurt anything to score it the way that you did, but just just an observation. All right, so here we're starting off pianissimo, and I notice that you are maintaining the um, uh, the articulation and slurring that Barvinsky had. So uh, you know, it just just goes goes to like, you know, are you thinking about what tenuto means in? Um, uh, brass and wind and string parts as opposed to piano parts, right? So he wants a nice full tone, but like not necessarily loud, right? Um, so, I mean, you certainly will get that with the, uh, with the contrabassoon and the tuba working together, but, uh, you know, I mean, just, just to, just to be clear, the, like the, the, the beautiful articulation that these players usually play in notes like this is going to be replaced with a kind of just this really more full kind of slightly honky kind of a kind of an articulation but still it's since it's going to be pianissimo maybe it doesn't that make that much of a difference but anyways just you know think about that if you are importing articulation styles from piano parts Right, and then we're going to bass clarinet and cello. So a really nice combination dovetailing off of the contrabassoon solo, which def you know when you fill it in like this, and just and you know the minute you add strings, it stops becoming a you know a, the the tone does not does not seem like it is a continuation. It seems like it's adding on, right? Which obviously it is. It's just that the you know, the the strings don't have or the cellos don't have the ability to um, to just merge right into the especially a, t a tone that is a little rougher and uh, um, you know kind of darker. Yeah. All right, but cool setup. So where do you head? Right here. All right. Harp is getting most of the harmony, or pretty much all the harmony. You have these other instruments uh, jumping in. Bass clarinet is basically takes over the lower voice, so that you have uh, English horn and uh, violas playing the uh, B here. Yeah, so uh, you know, I mean, that's that's a cool choice. Interesting color. 
so there, just a comment about this line. Here you divide uh, between solo and glial tree violas. Okay, and looking at the scoring of this, it's completely identical. And then here it's identical to the end. And then here you have this little solo part. So you, do, you don't need to do this divisi staff, right? All you would need is just, you know, just get rid of all this, just make this the viola line. And and this here's all the violas playing together. They're all doing fine. There's no difference between these two staves, right? And then when you get to here, solo viola playing, and then unison, right? Or tutti actually would be a better way of putting it, not unison. So yeah, so tutti to cancel solo, unison to cancel divisi. All right, and then yeah, so yeah, see, so this this whole staff is 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 unnecessary. I would cut it for your final version, and I'm hoping that you are going to make a final version of this, and I'm hoping that you're going to try to get it played because it's so cool. All right. Um, so I think that you can get away with not marking the harp louder here because everything is just so minimal, right? It's the same thing with the celesta. You can leave the celesta at piano. Maybe mezzo piano would work. Now here, like kind of pushing into this, I think that I would have my harp kind of go to mezzo piano here rather than just piano. I would make it a little bit bigger. Especially when you start bringing in the horn. Because horn is a notorious absorbent of, um, of harp resonance. So the harp would need to be a little bit louder here. And also just the sound picture is getting bigger and bigger even though you have marked it pianissimo. Okay, one, one thing that I am, well, okay, all right, I'm not going to, I'll mention this in a second. I was about to talk about it. So, but let's just focus on your treatment of the melody, all right? So obviously the, the, you know, the nice rolling chords and so on are being played mostly by harp. Here you've got uh, some of this harmony right in here. So kind of a, yeah. Yeah, see, so I'm just kind of my my eyes are kind of flipping back and forth between. Right. Yeah, so, you know, that's all really really gorgeous, really soft and uh, and lovely, and works really super in the context of the celesta part and the harp. <clears throat> so yeah, so. Absolutely no problems here. I love how the bassoon comes back right in here um, to kind of take the place of the bass clarinet. Um, a much better companion in octaves, just much more, um, much much more unity. And but you, you know, you continue to not put, not double it with uh, cellos, which is just an interesting choice. It really is. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, So I'm I'm not really with you uh, on the way that you changed the um, you changed the melodic arc here. Um, I, I I feel that like just kind of looking at at the way that this all turned out. I'm not seeing Doloroso in the melody either. You know, da 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 voice crossing, or not voice crossing, but implied leap. Da da right? So it, it we kind of have, like, by having everybody jump up to A here, you know, your violas, just basically, they they become subsidiary to the, um, to, to the descending line. So that's, that's the first problem. Um, yeah. Right. And then, yeah, then see like you're doubling the oboe part and the, so this just further kind of confuses the melodic arc right in here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm I'm just not totally with you on this. Um, I, I feel. Yeah, you know, and then like you 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 have the horn, which like in power, you know, is equal at pianissimo to everything that is happening before it, really. Um, I don't know if I would mark this second horn. I think that I would just have this played by the first horn. Da, 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 da. Um, just kind of an observation, just to absolutely make sure that you are aware here that if you are going to mark tenuto marks on all of these um, all of these notes, just the way that they are in the Barbinsky score, that you're going to get nice long bows, like zoom, zoom, zoom. So whenever you see a, a tenuto mark on a, uh, without a slur, just a, just a plain tenuto mark on a, on a string part, just think of the word zoom, right? Like how maybe somebody who was describing, you know, vocally, you know, what a staccato is might say doink, you know, or did, so like this would be zoom. Right. Da, zoom, zoom, zoom. Right. So, like the 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 thing is like the the bow moves faster because the um you want you, know, you you're not really moderating it. You it's the there isn't an articulation shape. It is just like one blocky shape. Right. So the you know it, you may be losing some poetry here by scoring it this way. You could. You could add a slur and make it into parto portato, you know. Um, yeah. You know, so it could be like, mm, 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 as opposed to zoom, 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 note, right? Anyway, um, just some things to think about there. Yeah, so... You know, aside from that, and then, and then like, like you, like, here's another problem is that, you know, let's forget about the implied leap. You know, da, 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 bum, bum. Uh, let's just think about how melodically, like in terms of melodic development, how you give away, like when you go to this note too soon, then you give away this note. Right, like it, it dramatically, you know. If this is the is the, if this is the peak of power in this particular gesture, then by going to this higher note too soon, it we kind of are. It's 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 too much foreshadowing. It's too much for me anyway. It's it's too much. Looks like you're just really like handing out the sweets before the end of the meal is kind of the way it feels like to me right here. All right, and then this is really lovely, the way that you change around all the functions right in here. That's nice. Bassoon and uh, horn working together. Yeah, and, you know, here's some nice, soft, high scoring. You know, top note is E or E flat, you know. So it's 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 a little easier to control. I think that it, it makes a beautiful sound. The horn is going to really dominate right in here. Um, so it's good that the partner above is oboe and has like a more pungent sound. And then the cooler clarinet down here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just nicely scored, I feel, right in here. It's good, um, you know, good solid uh, wind, chamber wind scoring, like, you know, um, like a wind quintet with a flute taken out or with the flute sort of standing by. Yeah, and lovely stuff right in here. The strings sort of fading out and then here um, with the violas, right, uh, doing a little bit of doubling of the French horn part right in here. Yeah, so some just really some nice, some nice choices. And then uh, solo viola. Yeah, uh, you know, wait a second. Like I, I'm just, I, I'm still kind of stuck on this. All right, so just to talk about slurring, you've got really long slurs on some parts, left them out on others. 
is sort of kind of wondering what's up with that. Um, really long slur here and just kind of quickly referencing. Yeah, so I mean that's such a long slur and it's it's not even in the in the regular regular piano part, right? And it's I think that I think that the instruments need to articulate together here at the beginning of this phrase rather than the you know just sort of I may be overly smooth here in the oboe. Um yeah, and and also like if there's going to be a push here, see like you have it built right into the um into the bowing like if you were to just get rid of this slur here then the instruments could push forwards right on the on the up bow it's an absolute perfect choice but since you have given them like just this all under one bow which would probably be a down bow it's just you know it's it's really long and it you know that means that they're going to be using less bow and they'll have less energy with which to push right so um yeah. Anyway, so think about that a little bit. Watch out. You know, don't don't let the slurs just be slurs. Really think about the bowing patterns. All right. So back to this. <laughs> um, so solo viola. I can't get enough of. I think it's just a really beautiful sound. And then this is lovely coming in here with the. English horn, A clarinet. Yeah, the thing about it is, like, if it's going to be A clarinet for the entire piece and horns in F for the entire piece, I don't think we need to know that it is, you know, clarinet in A. If you had a group of clarinets in B flat next to them, then I think you would need the clarinet in A. Same thing, English horn in F. English horns are always in F. We don't need to know in the little, you know, the little sidebar here, the little, the abbreviated, um, yeah, I just I feel it's completely unnecessary. Uh, uh, anybody out there who is um, developing notation apps, like you know, I mean, how often in an older published score do you see the you know the tuning of the of the instruments laid out like this? Okay, um, all right. Yeah, that's all cool. Da, 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 da. Yeah, just really beautiful. Um, yeah, the way that the strings and the and clarinet and English horn are working together. Yeah, and then unison, this all works together really beautifully. Bass clarinet coming in here, doubling the cellos and so on. And the pizzicato and just contrabassoon coming in and playing that low note it's really really nicely scored right here at the end so you know fantastic way to to bring everything to an end and and really nice um uh nice resonance with the scoring that you had before now let's jump back to d and, and i have to say that the 15 year old in me is uh, looking at this, also listening to your mock-up and thinking, you know, how metal is that? But yeah, it, it really, you know, it really is a no-holds-barred kind of uh, scoring. All right, so so let's talk about a few uh, scoring things, speaking of which. Um, one is just kind of, you know, clearing up visual clutter. Okay, and and also a little bit of a philo philosophy about about scoring crescendo using text. So, I strongly approve of using text to score a gradual crescendo over many many bars. Okay, because adding a really really long hairpin just adds to the visual weight. However having really long dashed lines, dotted lines, also adds to the visual weight. And also the word crescendo, um, you know, usually I think of crescendo lasting about one or two bars, right? Or even just, just the inside of a phrase inside one bar. 
Poco a poco crescendo, though, that's basically saying keep getting louder until you see the next, uh, the next dynamic mark, right? So you could get rid of all of this clutter and all of these parts just by saying poco a poco crescendo here, all right? And then, then nobody needs any of these dashed lines. And, and here too, right? You've got another poco a poco crescendo. Yeah, so I would say that like um, if you if you have a crescendo that lasts a bar or two, then you can just say crescendo, right? But you can say poco a poco crescendo, especially if the especially if the music is slow. But uh, yeah, but if it's fast crescendo, it's pretty obvious that it's the same thing as a hairpin across the two bars. Okay, but you know it's just like there's no need to do this with a dashed line. But three bars, I would go to a poco a poco crescendo. That's just my particular uh, set of uh, personal rules that nobody has to agree with. Now here you have first clarinet, but you have the dynamic markings on top where they crash into the dynamic markings above, right? So you could avoid all of that by just having piano here. I mean, you're telling us that this is first clarinet. So if you're saying that this is first clarinet here, and there are no, um, there's no second voice scoring here, which there isn't, right? There isn't even any second voice rests in here. Then there's zero need for these dynamic markings to be above the staff. Have them below the staff, right where they belong, right where it will clutter things up less. Now, I wanna say that I really appreciate that you made things at a larger staff size. It really, really is helpful. And I noticed that things got a little crowded and you could have solved some of that just by pulling up the, um, you know, just increasing the, the height of your score image and maybe like dropping down, like de decreasing the margins on both sides. And that would give you more because like obviously like this isn't this is not a sheet of music for publication where people are handling them from the sides and there's printing and there's cutting and all that other stuff where you want a wider margin this is a screen image and it it can just fill the entire darn screen right you know and um you know hopefully people can click off those little adsense um things whenever they occur although you know i don't i do not monetize my videos yet huh? Uh, not yet, you know. The only thing that will ever cause me to monetize my videos is if Amazon starts monetizing the ones that I have that are unmonetized, which they have said that they might do. They might just start, you know, if, if any video becomes popular beyond a certain amount of views, they might just monetize it for themselves. And then, you know, so if you're not a partner, then, you know, but like, it's like, I just think about that and I'm saying, well, look, you know, could I use that money to research something so that I can provide more content for the community rather than just giving it to, you know, whoever is um, owning and running Google. So, uh, yeah, so that would be my philosophy if I do monetize in the future. But you know, anyways, I'm getting off on a tangent here. But yeah, um, just you do not need wide margins on top and bottom for this kind of this kind of um, evaluation this visual sort of thing. So you could have given yourself even a little bit more space in here and not had so many collisions. All right. Uh, all right. Let me get back on topic here. So, yeah. So just, you know, just looking at that treatment of, you know, that, you know, those scoring issues and so on, the treatment of those parts and, and so, and etc. All right. So now let's talk about the scoring. You're starting off here Everybody really, really soft, uh, and uh, English horn and clarinet uh, playing together here, doing this little unison melody. It's a beautiful, beautiful sound. Fantastically gorgeous sound. Um, there is a problem, though, okay? And that is with our little cascading octaves. The problem is that, uh, well, there, there are many problems, okay. All right, the first one is um, you've scored your harp in Celesta really soft to match the dynamic of the soft horns. Uh, we, have we had a discussion about this, how horns are so much louder than everybody else, or, that, or at least 
so much louder than hor- than harp and celesta. I just mentioned earlier about horns absorbing harp, t- uh, you know, harp tones, harp resonance. Now, I think that like. I think that right in here, your harp should be mezzo forte. But even at that, it's not quite enough because of the um, the sheer penetration of the of the melody here. That's going to take up a lot of space. So, you know, you can have celesta at mezzo forte, harp at mezzo forte, and it doesn't matter. It's still not going to be enough to really convey this function all that, um, you know, all that effectively. So you may not have put enough weight on this. Now let's stay with the harp for a second because I kind of don't want to come back to it. Um, you know, continuing on, um, uh, you know, we're, we're getting to this kind of wider scoring in here and you have harp coming in here to sort of bolster what's going on in the, in, um, uh, the lower, brass and um, a little touch of contrabassoon and and lower strings here. Harp it just has zero chance. Uh, it, you know, the its lowest strings are the are are really soft. You know, and you can you can mark it up to fortissimo if you like to, but like it still does not like they they get covered so easily. So the harp really isn't doing a whole lot in here. And then here you have a glissando from this D to this G. And you probably noticed in the mock-up, you really can't hear it, right? And here we have another one, uh, you know, uh, glissando up to this octave here. So the thing is that nobody is going to hear these octaves. They might hear a little bit of glissando. So what's important here is not the, is not the um, starting point and not the destination. It is the journey, right? So, um, so don't even worry about you know how the how the end point is going to sound whether or not it's going to make any kind of impact you should just say how long of a glissando do i want the shorter the glissando the less the um the less of a of, of an impact it will make in a big tutti with fortissimo uh, strings and winds and uh marcato brass right and fortissimo lower heavy brass the harp basically just has no shot unless you were to make this like in the space of this time right here you would have to make it like three or four octaves i would say go to four or five octaves if you can just really make it sweep because this this is you know this is such such a small distance to go this is like an octave and a half not even right and so you know just it just doesn't really you know it's it's the the uh, fewer notes in a glissando, the uh, excuse me, excuse me, the shorter the distance of the glissando, the fewer the notes, the less amount um, of sweep, right? So you just really need much much more sweep in these glissandi if you want the harp to play an audible role. <clears throat> All right, and then yeah, and once again, these low notes here in the harp are just not they cannot possibly add to anything here right and then you just completely leave harp out at the end and that's and that's great so uh while we're on the topic of um or we just left the topic of um of notation um standards and so on uh yeah this is something that has kind of crept into uh, dorico and and other notation applications the notion that symbols should be marked with an x note head yet you know what um while it certainly is something that percussionists will not have a problem with, it is it is completely unnecessary. Okay, it just there is nothing about this that would could not just be a normal dotted uh, like a, a circular standard um, dotted whole note would be fine. Just go crash. You can say LV. You can have an incomplete like a little incomplete uh, tie. You can have the little LV tie that's short, which I think is, you know, I mean, it just kind of makes no sense to me when you could just drop a a, a nice juicy tie on there to kind of say, well, you know, it's going to last longer than this bar. That makes more sense. So, yeah, so, you know, X out the X note heads 
in concert scores. All right, it's just really, you know, it's like a drum kit thing. It's really unnecessary. All right. Okay, so let's get back to the beginning of D. <laughs> All right, and uh, just really focus on the um, like how everything is all scored out besides this. But just you know, but just to tell you, I feel I feel like your cascading octaves need a lot more bulking up. Just in general, you have instruments that aren't being used that could um, could play a part in this role. You do not need to jump down an octave like it does in the piano score, right? Which is just done because of the focus of the hands in that particular section. They need to be closer together. Uh, so you are not playing a piano with the orchestra. You do not need the uh, the cascading octaves to drop. All right. So bolster them back up because here they're you know here. They're soft, they're really hard to hear, really hard to hear, they're gone, right? By the time you're adding the crescendo to the horns, you know, winds and strings coming in more richly, there's just no way with celesta and harp to be able to contribute anything meaningful here, right? There's, you'll hear a little bit of the cascade in the, um, you know, in the strings as they drop, but there's no support for that either in your lower winds, right? So I just, I feel that the whole... For, at least for this section, the whole issue of cascading octaves needs to be revisited, needs to be bolstered up if you want it to, to have more of a role. If you don't, if you don't, don't mind it being a really minimal background kind of a thing, disregard everything I just said. All right, now I'm just going to jump up. I just want to see how everything ties together. Yes, yeah, so you have the diminuendo, piano, diminuendo, and then tying from these... Right. Dun, dun. Yeah. Um. About the only thing that I would possibly critique in here is, do you do you really want to like not have a snap to your um, um, to the way that this, you know, you know, da, 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 right, in the piano part, because, like, the piano is a percussion instrument, right? So even if you have very soft, clingy, clangy, um, sustained notes, you still have the attack going, dun, dun, dun. It's very precise, right? But when you go, dun, dun, uh, you know, we just really kind of get no snap to the, to the, you know, to the short note leading to the longer note with just a kind of really long, long slur over everything. And shouldn't these slurs match, right? We have a really long one over the English horn part and we have a kind of short one. See, like this is what I'm talking about. This is a lot cleaner. We, you know, we just, this really leads into this really nicely. You hear the, you hear the, um, uh, you hear the articulation on the downbeat here, which I, I feel just really helps to define the phrase. Right, so we're losing that definition in the English horn. It's sort of, kind of, wallpapering over everything. Right. Yeah, and then here, you know, da da. So you can see that there needs to be a, you know, a push on the downbeat. But then here you're covering it with the bass clarinet. Right, and then here it's sort of confusing. Now you have yet another slur. So I think you need to. to I think you need to proofread these slurs a little bit better. Ta 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 ta. I guess that just works fine with, like, especially with all the cascades when they're in their place, right? So just you know, and try to maybe have, you know, if you're going to do this with your horns, maybe the articulation should match in the in the other horns too, right? That's it's kind of an intriguing way of of. You know, it's like here you have the third horn above the second, and then the first. Yeah, okay, so that all makes sense. And then second and third. Yeah, so like, it's kind of interesting. You're kind of withholding the first. Uh, that's all fine. I don't know if I would send the first horn below the third here, though. But I mean, I like you're you're treating it you're treating it more as a you know you're thinking about the role of the first horn as a um you know playing the counter melody more clearly and then the 
you know, but you know, what if they what if the first horn went uh G sharp, right? And then this became a third horn line, you know. Just like you do here. But yeah, but get rid of this slur here, right? Okay. Just, you know, ta ta. And then here, ta ta ta. I'm sort of starting to sound like that Song of Summer movie. <laughs> All right, so yeah, and like here you you go ta ta ta, and here you go uh, ta ta, just like you did before. Choose one, don't do both. Okay. Yeah, and then and then yeah yeah, so just make them all agree. It's much much more effective just in terms of the articulation of it. Okay. All right. So yeah, kind of got sidetracked there. We were thinking about the scoring. Once again, unison, um, a clarinet and English horn, and then taking you know going to the octave here, and then adding the oboe in, doubling with the English horn, and then and and so on. So yeah, then here going to the octave. It, just some really nice ideas here in the scoring, the clarinets uh, doubling that octave and the flutes on top. It's really a beautiful idea here. And the, the horn's kind of tracking everything harmonically below uh, with the trumpet coming in here to bolster what's going on in your first horn, uh, first and third horn. Right. It's really nice. It's a beautiful setup to the to the um to this nice widespread harmony here. So, you know, this, you know, one thing I could say, like point out to people watching this, like, um, you know, what lessons can you learn from Julianne's score is that like, she's treating each section, like not as its own separate thing, but as, uh, as elements that lead to other elements. Right. And she sets up the, the, the progression to that element really, really nicely at, you know, sometimes throughout the entire, uh, section sometimes you know leading into the next section it just really has a wonderful cohesion right in here just so nicely done all right so um like these four bars like up to here excuse me um they really are kind of their own mini section as well Right, and this is this is what I've sort of characterized as like the Ravel part, right? So, just because of the you know the um, the the chords and their voicings are very Ravel like, um, it really kind of reminds me of a page from Ondine or from Scarbo, which is you know it was written the same year as as uh, Le Tombo, or sorry, not Le Tombo, uh, from as uh, Gaspard de la Nuit. So, it just really makes me wonder, you know how exposed to Ravel was Barvinsky, right? But I mean, I, I, I would say that it's a case of both Ravel and Barvinsky being influenced by Debussy's progression, you know, forwards, um, you know, the, his middle of the first decade uh, expansion of the piano's role, I think we're seeing in both of those composers, right? Okay, um, yeah, so so really nice scoring going in here without you know tortuously breaking it down. Just you know seeing the seeing all the the violins conspiring with the flutes up here. Uh, if, the, if the flutes are going to be playing exactly the same thing, there's no need to have separate stems on them. Just say a due, right? A two at the top, and then you will get your. Um, you know, that, that is all that the engraver and the conductor needs to read. It's just, it's just visual clutter, right? We want to cut down on visual clutter. And then, you know, all the other parts harmonizing below. You're giving your English horn a little bit of a break. Yeah. And you're leaving some space in here for your brass to do their thing, right? No, no sense over cluttering it. Though, I'm a little puzzled that you dropped out your, um, like, your middle um, voice right in here, the um, second, third, and fourth horns are just completely disappeared. And I'm, I'm a little puzzled by that. Uh, you know, you, you can hear their absence in the score. I'm wondering why you made that decision. Why, you know, starting just, you know, beautifully strong here and then just leaving them out.
right and uh, yeah and this all works great now once again <laughs> leaping octaves right this is uh, kind of an ongoing concern here you know in the in the left hand story you know so it, it um, I wonder whether this is really enough you know I mean like you I mean yeah you've got you've got your lower heavy brass and you've got your lower wind excuse me lower strings all working together on it I mean and they're marked forte eh. It, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I just feel that there's like, if the bass clarinet could have also played a role or something, I just feel that there just needs to be something a little bit more and the harp just doesn't cut it. It's just, you know, to repeat what I said before, you know, might as well just let, let the harpist um, get ready to play the glissando on the next screen and just make it a big nice juicy long one if you want if you want it to add to the sound picture all right um so let's move on to um <laughs> our massive tutti in here and w one thing that i would say that is the strongest about this is the shifting of roles Okay, and, and that is so important. Uh, it keeps things from getting repetitive, right? Like you can write the most exciting tutti. You can, uh, you can orchestrate the most exciting tutti out of the piano score for this section. But if the same elements continue just blasting away for too long, even though it's over the course of only 11 bars, it can become just wearing by the end. It's just like, yeah, when is this over, right? You don't want your... You don't want your audience to to think that, right? Okay. Now, uh, one thing that you must understand about the um, about low playing, right, is that it really requires a lot of breath. It needs to be replenished fairly quickly, uh, and even at a higher speed like this, um, I think you get your best results from not having too long of a note. Now, having said that, I'm sure that a bass trombonist will say, will jump in and say, oh, I can play that and I can make that last a long time. Sure you can, but the second note will not have as much impact as the first. And also this slur across, you know, uh, Julianne, I mean, have you missed some of my, my, um, my writings and videos about how you shouldn't slur across the, um, across the bar like this from an upbeat unless you really have a good reason for it. I feel that the reason is not justified. You want these notes to fall like a hammer blow, right? So how can how can the hammer blow how blow? How can the hammer fall if it's slurred forwards? Yeah, so I, I just think that these slurs are completely unnecessary. Boom. Let them use up all of their breath, quickly re retake the breath if they need to here. Boom. So yeah, so I would get rid of these. Now here in the contrabassoon, slur this and then boom on that, right? Slur this, boom. I like that. I like the fact that the contrabassoon mixes it up a little bit. I think that that's beautiful, and you know it also helps it find a little bit more unity with the timpani here. Same thing with double bass. Double bass bow is shorter and broader, right? Um, although some double bass uh, players use a, what's called a French style bow, which is nearly the length of a uh, of a cello bow. But all that aside, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Fortissimo is going to use up the length of that bow very quickly. So you know this does not really feel all that rational to me. the s The slower that the bow has to move across the strings, the less loud they can play. Right? Cut this. Cut that. It's it's you know I I do not see I do not see what the what the benefit is in having a smooth transition from this note to the next one I don't see the benefit of having a smooth transition from the pickup note across here right with the impact of what you're scoring here this massive punching battering kind of a thing while you're underpowering some of the notes in your basses you just watch out for that don't do that all right just give us let the hammer fall 
on every bar. Okay, um, <clears throat> now let's talk about the um, the way that the functions shift before we really take them apart, which which I think is just really wonderful. Um, you know, for the most part, like your melody kind of stays in the same instruments here. Okay, but you are you know you're sort of backing off on some of the use of the of the heavy brass in here i guess middle heavy brass you could say trumpets and trombones just adding a little bit adding a little bit and then jumping in more right in here and i love the way that the bass trombone gets higher right in here i think that that's a very very cool idea um yeah and then uh, right in here dropping out the the winds so that you get a different color here kind of draggier and more um, more focused on the lower end um, it just more fiercely that is also very cool all right all right so let's take apart the um, the melody to start off with um, so uh, you know if I, I would if I would have a critique here it I think that it would be that your second violin part here is just going to get swallowed into the maelstrom, right? And your piccolo part, uh, right in here, um, you know, kind of doubling the um, the harmonization from above in the flute. I mean, it's a cool idea. I just kind of wonder. I, I wonder why the why the violin scoring couldn't have gone higher because like you might be thinking well I don't want to go all the way up to um, you know I'm already at C sharp 6 here do I want to go all the way up to C sharp 7 and the answer to that is you can do it same th same way you can have the piccolo go all the way up to that C sharp right and these instruments can be doubling together and the second violins can be up an octave where the viol the first violins are Everybody can be an octave higher, and that way you can hear the second violins a lot more clearly. Yeah, so just a just a little bit of you know, uh, yeah, just a just a little bit of misgivings about how the um, about how some of this is laid out. But I mean, there's no question that the first violin line is going to be really, really clear, very easy to hear, even over all of these arcing uh, horns and repeating trumpets and so on. Yeah. All right. Um, then, you know, right in here, we, your, your, your mock-up, you know, you're adding to the kind of boisterous sound of the uh, of your marcato brass right in here uh, you also have this sort of scrubbing sound of the uh, of fortissimo tremolo you know so like we add them together and you, it sort of almost sounds like crowd noise in the mock-up but it's not going to sound like that in real life there, but there will be that sense of excitement uh, it's just a question of whether or not you know like how loud can these instruments play <laughs> um, this you know a scary monster kind of music right here in the middle so I mean they can get to be pretty loud but I don't think that they can get to be as loud as what's going on here in the in your brass right so there is a real risk that this right in here is going to be covered to a degree uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it but it just like just as long as you're aware that like when you hear them when you hear the orchestra play that this part may sort of gently disappear into the onslaught of what the brass are doing uh, really love the bassoon scoring in here, and uh, that's all really awesome. The bass clarinets as well, and it all ties together uh, in, in a in a really beautiful way. I would say the the tremolo here, the bassoons, the bass clarinet, and that all really helps to ground everything else happening in the music to the foghorn bass lines, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, these just solid, solid D sharps down here played by everybody. It's like nothing in between. Um, one thing to kind of notice here is that the, um, that, you know, Barvinsky does not score such a lonely 
low bass note down here. He's got octaves in his piano score, right? So, um, you know, all of those things that I talked about that help to join up the the bass line to the uh, to the rest of the music start to kind of really depart, right? You've got you you lose your um, you lose your bassoons. Um, we still have bass clarinet working there, right? But it is really kind of more doubling what's going on here in the bass trombone and getting higher and higher, right? Rather than having a position that's lower down. And then, you know, this stuff right in here, um, all this exciting stuff right in here, you know, to the extent that this is all doubling the melody, it's really, really great. To the extent that nothing is doubling it uh, melodically all that much, um, it, it's, you know, I feel it's a little lonely, right? All right, so um, just to put all that aside, looking at how everything is scored here, um, one and two, three and four in your, in your um, horns, you don't need to put in these gaps. These gaps in here have more to do with the way that the piano was being played, right? So you can just fill in this gap here. You can fill in this gap if you want to. Rest, da 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 da, and then you could go da 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 da. Right, so like you could just make this a reverse, right? So this is uh, an arc going up. This could be an arc going down and looping back, and then rest, da 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 da, ba bum ba bum. Right, so yeah, so I would say get rid of the gaps, right? Because they've certainly gone here. So shouldn't this reflect that, right? All right. Yeah, and then like in here you have gaps that respect the fact that the the, the motion of the octave melody, but you, they don't need to be in there either, right? And this this part could just be going, you know, da 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 da. Right. I I, like, I love the way that a breath is built into the piano score, right? For these poor people to be blasting away like this. Uh, marcato is great. I would put the marcato mark after the dynamic rather than above in, in technique text and these bars. Yeah, you know, really nice straightforward. Yeah, and then, right, so, okay, right, so this adue mark has jumped up because of the marcato, yeah, so just marcato down here, and you can do it in, in, um, in italic text, right? Yeah, so nice. So like everything really settles in here when you start adding the timpani. And, you know, I mean, to the extent that timpani sort of ties together the low end a little bit, um, maybe it's not such a big gripe that, you know, we're losing some of the some of the way that everything was all tied together in the low end. This will sort of, this blasting going through here. Yeah, you know, not such a big gripe. Yeah, and then I've already talked over this part right in here. This is this is nice. I almost feel like you should start rolling here. You know, I know that sounds like people going you know, or something, whatever. Like um, rolling in the back of their throat, which I don't want to do um, in public. But yeah, um, yeah, really cool scoring. I just really love the way everything comes together here. Uh, I would not bother you know, not even bother putting in this low B here in flute. It's not doing anything. Yeah, it is gone. It's behind everything. It's being blasted away. Just go a do a a two here with your with your flutes. Um, and then it's okay to have the piccolo tripling that. Then you get the tone weight you need. But yeah, but don't don't send your poor second flute player down into no man's land where they'll just get shelled. Yeah, so really love this section. Such great work, Julianne. I think you should be, you know, out of, I mean, out of all the great, great moments in this orchestration, I think you should be proudest of this because I feel that this, you know, this really does uh, give the listener very clear functions and, and it's all incredibly exciting and all just tied together so well. Really, really great work. And so now back to the very beginning. So I hope you'll forgive me, Julianne, if I don't spend the same kind of incredibly intensive time on this that I did on sections E and D. 
Uh, it's just that, you know, I don't want to make this video too long. I've, I, I spent more than an hour on looking at those sections. So, um, so, so let's um, not dwell on too many things, but just a, a few, a few uh, layout things. Like here, we can see that like if your margins had been smaller, you know, you could just go down to a very small margin here, and and a much smaller one above, then uh, there wouldn't be so much squashing in here, right? And you could even just put all of your horns on one staff, right? Just like say horns and F, you don't really have them, so you know, save a little bit of time. Same thing, trumpets and C, they could have all been on one staff and so on. Um, and uh, Celesta could have just had one, uh, had a single. Uh, had a single staff rather than the grand staff. Same thing with harp, since you're only using the right hand here. All right, so um, it's like the the approach that you take here is is pretty straightforward in terms of just everybody finding their role, finding their place, sticking to it, and there isn't like there isn't a whole lot of change. And my only reaction that, to that would be, oh, you know, what a shame, because you're such an imaginative orchestrator. I was hoping that you would find some kind of timbral progression that would tell more of a story, right? I, I think that the, 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 the less timbral development there is in a passage like this, the more it just becomes about setting a mood rather than having a narrative. Do you know what I mean? So... You know, but all that aside, I mean, it's beautifully scored. Don't get me wrong. And I love the whole idea of the octaves um, in these parts uh, playing together. And then, you know, it, like the, the flute and the viola, solo viola at octaves with the clarinets below down a... I, I, would, I would not mark them solely, okay? Don't have them play out because you... this this. And you don't say solely for the flute, just say solo, right? This is a solo part, and that is a solo part, right? When you say solely, it gives the violist the idea, oh, the, we are all going to play solely together, right? So just solo here, solo here. No, uh, the clarinets don't need to be solo. And then the flutes. All right. Now, you, you're being judicious with your, your scoring here, and, and that's really nice, like so that we have nice up bows and down bows, all right? But I, I'm, you know, I mean, here you have like a little portato, you know, uh, 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 you know, like, so it, doesn't this need to be more precise? Uh, Ta-ta. Do you know what I mean? Ta-ta. I mean, da, uh, uh, I, I just feel it's a sort of gluey. Putting in a tenuto mark right in there, I think I think staccato works better and not slurred, right? Da, ta, ta, ta. I like this slurring better than this. But yeah, your winds are very very kind of uh, the the slurring is is really really long on a lot of this. It could it could be shortened a bit, you know, to like gestures, ta, right? <clears throat> yeah, and then, you know, like, if you're going to do this here, then you should do that there, right? And and maybe not slur from here, but slur from here. Yeah, that's, I feel that the slurring is just a little too long and a little too indiscriminate. You know, try to just really, you know, use the slur to clarify the phrasing. Yeah, but I'm really glad that you didn't slur over repeated notes. That's great. Fantastic. Um, yeah, here I would put a um, tenuto at both ends of the of the slur, right? To make it, you know, mm, uh, to you know, give the pulse, rather than going da, uh, right? And it's just that's just the customary way. This is very rarely seen that you know just the slur forward to you know, just just put it put the put the tenuto mark on both ends. I would say. And if you really must do portato here, then do it on the other end of this as well. But I just, it just is just too gloopy, I think. It doesn't really have a pulse. Like the, it, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't philosophically agree with that. But, you know, it's... And then here, you don't need to go solo glee altri at all. 
all you need to do is just say that these are the violas and this is a solo part, right? And then you go back to 2T the next time you see your violas, right? So that's so this is another thing that you could cut to help the uh, the vertical space at this opening. Now, um, just to quickly mention the bassoon taking this role in here, that's beautiful, and then and then becoming more involved here, uh, that's also really lovely. So that just leaves the harp, and um, Julianne, I'm, I, I think you may have missed that. You know, I, I've had some discussions about octave harmonics in harps, and like what is the upper limit of harmonics in harps. Um, and the um, when you have a harmonic note in um, below and one above, the um, lower one tends to cancel out the upper one, right? So, I mean, it's a beautiful idea, but it just is, it does kind of doesn't work in practicality. And the other problem, too, is that it is really hard, almost impossible, for the harpist to form um, uh, a uh, this sound up way, way, way up here. You know, you're asking them, like, think about how short the harp strings are up in this register way up here. And just like, just putting the palm there and getting like a nice, uh, a nice thunky kind of a, you know, like a do kind of a sound, right? So the, the optimum register for harps to be playing uh, um, harmonics is down right in here. Just, I would just say, just take away the harmonics, right? If you want these pitches up here, take away the harmonics. All right, and it'll sound perfectly fine. It'll sound glorious. There's no need for the harmonics way up there, right? The harps already have all this harmonic information. Um, one way to get um, to get effective octave harmonics is to have two separate harp players, right? That they'll be far enough away to where the you know the vibration of the strings in the in the instrument coming from the soundboard don't cancel each other out. But, you know, scoring them way up here, as high as D, I would not even bother with. Better to score them like two octaves lower, all right? But then that takes away the effect that you wanted in here. So I would just say take away the harmonics and just leave it the way that it is. All right, so now we're getting into this scoring. And this is really, really beautiful. Um, I, I noticed that you have stems down here in your um, in this harp part and that would that would sort of make sense if if you were to go stems down with the uh, with the first beam group and with the first note in each bar so like so this would be uh, stems down would be in left hand then right hand takes it over and then left hand plays this right so left right left so the stems down would make sense then right but this you know no way is the right hand going to be able to reach so far down so this would have to be stems down Yeah, and then here, like once again, stems down, stems up, right? So left hand, right hand, left hand. And that that's perfect sense. I think that a little roll mark here would be nice. And I've already gone into lengthy detail about um, how Poco a Poco Crescendo not only clarifies the length of the crescendo, but it also unclutters everything, right? So here we have... We have three bars, two and a half bars of of crescendo to the mezzo forte. So poco poco crescendo is perfectly, you know, works perfectly fine. <clears throat> Soltasto here on this is really really beautiful, but I just have to warn you that it will be less. It'll have less um, push to it, right? It's it's a it's a kind of a slightly chestier sound. Um, it, it doesn't have that as much dig. Uh, as you might think. So like when things start to get louder and louder right in here, it, it's going to not, I mean, you think, oh, it's going to be really beautiful and lush and, and heartfelt and everything else. But like then you're, you're getting into issues of the fact that these instruments are playing harmony with each other with uh, you muted here and then, you know, yeah, one, two, one, two, con okay, look, we already know that these like in the part, this will be the first part, and that will be the second part, second divisi part. So you don't need to say one consort, two consort. Just like just put the marking over each staff, and that's good enough. 
yeah. But I mean, it's a it's a really great idea. Muted strings, uh, playing the melody in octaves here, and then the um, muted second violins playing, and so on. But I'll I'll tell you something, um, Julianne. Like uh, up into up to about about right here, like pretty much all of this could have been sh scored on one staff divisi. You don't really need to split until you get to these. And like even here, these could be uh, interlocking intervals and still stay on the same uh, on the same staff. And then you know here the, there could be two part writing and and still stay on the same staff. Right, still stay on the same staff. That's a tongue twister if I ever heard one. Now here you have this just beautiful idea here. Uh, Celesta. Usually uh, the the middle note of a staff is stems down rather than stems up. So like B, for instance, in treble staff, or D in bass staff. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, couldn't this be down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow? Right? rather than having these really long, because here you're going down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow. Do you see what it's just sort of like, it sort of miss, misses, messes up everything together. So I think that like, just like kind of the pattern that you had before works fine here. I know like you want really beautiful, long, smooth lines, but they're a little bit um, unedited, aren't they? So that's, and then here like, you know, da, ta, ta. I, I would just avoid a portato here. It just makes it gluey, right? Just you want a precise. Ta ta. You don't want it to be. Uh, ta. Yeah, and I really like the slurring here in the middle voices and lower voices. Really nice. Okay, so the treatment of the melody, the you know clarinets coming in here to bolster the, um, or the first clarinet coming in to bolster the celesta and uh, first violins. As you can hear in the mock-up, the Celesta still contributes some to the um, to the to the sound, but I would actually mark it piano from the beginning, right? And you're never going to get louder than mezzo piano, or I mean, you you should still score mezzo forte and forte for the Celesta, but it'll never sound louder than mezzo piano. So by the time it gets to here, it's really going to start to disappear. You might want to go to octaves when you get to a certain point, and by octaves, I don't mean like octaves um, below, but an octave above. I would just like add an octave here. Just, yeah. And it could be a boat, it could be a two-handed thing. So like this part go to treble clef in the, on the lower staff, and then this part an octave higher for the right hand. And then I think you get the, the clearer sound of the celeste if you really want it. Yeah, and then like, and you're just piling on more and more instruments here. Um, and I mean, that's all, that's all fine, but you know, it once, once more, it's going to obliterate the celesta, right? and you know the harp is going to become ever, ever more and more in, inconsequential with the you know as you approach mezzo forte with this much weight, you know, but but keep it in, keep it in. I would say if you are pushing towards a, like everybody having a dynamic marking right here, then the harp should get one too, and it should be like forte. And same thing with the with the celesta, right? Keep the celesta and the harp dynamics equal. So instead of pianissimo here, piano or mezzo piano in both parts, and then pushing towards a forte by the time you get to here. Yeah. But I mean, really cool uh, scoring of the second half of A, and then here we get to B. Um, yeah, so legato, just you just put a slur over everything, right? Just put a nice big juicy slur, put a big nice juicy slur over this and over this, and you don't really need to every you know the the harp is going to play legato kind of as a normal thing, and I definitely would mark this forte, right? Okay, so continuing on, we have some of the same strategies as before, the. Um, <clears throat> first violin uh, in unison with oboe and flute. Uh, then we have uh, clarinet an octave lower. 
which would be doubling the second part. I, I love the, the harmonization that you've got here in your strings. That's all good. And then the violas taking some of the harmony below. Um, and Celeste is still in the game. And here you go to octaves. I think they should have happened a lot earlier. Right. And here you're like, it's kind of interesting. Like it's, it's, you have inconsistent harmony here. The strings are pushing towards this. <clears throat> Right, um, with the winds really, really backing off, and I mean, I see why because you want this, you want this to be really, really sensitive going towards the end, right in here, right. But I, you know, what I would do is like, all right, you're dropping down to piano here, you're, are you going to pianissimo? I mean, it, I guess there, there is a logic to it, but you know, and and just that really sensitive, beautiful. Um, uh, like folk register of the piccolo when it's not too encumbered but you know but what is the dynamic here right we were just at mezzo forte back here right so so here we're going diminuendo a little bit and then a push back to is it going back to mezzo forte again it's just a little unclear right and if it is mezzo forte then the piccolo is a bit wasted here right because it's going to be a bit weaker than say a, a, a flute could have been there's ways of reshuffling all of this information and giving this to the first flute and making it a little stronger. But like if you really want this piccolo part right in here to contribute in a beautiful way, like you just have to be careful that you don't double it with things that will just, you know, make it make it inconsequential. Like, you know, for instance the clarinet right in here. Like, you know, it will just basically absorb all the beautiful folky uh subtle qualities here. Right now, if everybody, if you drop the dynamics here of these strings, like say that you went, say the the diminuendo for all parts went down to say piano here, and then you push forward to like say mezzo piano or something like that, and then fade it away even quicker, right? So I just think that the the piccolo, the addition of the piccolo here, it's fine. You can leave it in, but um, it's like, yeah, you can leave it in, but. Um, I, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. It'll, it'll add a little bit of tone weight and a little bit of color, but not, not really much else. And this is just really gorgeous right in here. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, let's stick with, uh, you know, before we go exploring with these exploring, uh, this exploring motive here. I love the way that you sort of fade away here, right? The problem that I'm seeing is from here to there to there, the the color more or less stays the same, right? You're saying, well, I got rid of the piccolo here and I added uh, English horn, but like, but you know, overall the effect of the of the you know, the quality of tone is really the same here, and there's still a lot of low end here. You know, you're adding this this just even just this one single cello here. Um, you know, is enough to just keep the context of the harmony rooted back to where it was before, right? I mean, if you think of these wandering motives as as being like a kind of a free spirit that is just going flying and like not knowing where it lands, right? It's sort of landing back where it started. If we keep the context of the of the of the the timbral quality the same, right? And then once again the positions of all of these notes are this are more or less the same except for this um f sharp here in the middle changes and the and the this e changes but like we still have e and c above here right so yeah i mean i just i just feel like we it's we're we're going in circles right so if there was some way to change this around, maybe like take out the winds and go to tremolo here, or I mean, is just some way of just really changing things around. You know, getting rid of the strings and having it just be really delicate, like as delicate as possible. Uh, winds, maybe maybe um, get rid of the the double reeds and just have flute family plus clarinet, right? And just just playing this chord. Because we really don't need so much weight here, right? Because it's really all about the harp. I would definitely mark solo here, right? And then the then the celesta coming in to to bulk it up a little bit, and then the solo continuing. I really love the like 
the the role that the celesta plays in here is it keeps the weight on the harp as it descends <clears throat> so that it, it doesn't lose um, projection, right? The the line doesn't lose projection. That's a really clever idea. Right, and then this uh, roll. Um, so yeah, I I have a slight problem with this, but I'll talk about it in a second. So so we're coming in here with uh, English horn, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's all good, and I I love the harmony in here, and and the role of the second violins, and and the the violas, excuse me, and the cellos on the bottom, and everything else. Okay, that's all gorgeous. Where you cross the line is where you add more. Like if you keep the bass going, you are clipping the wings of this beautiful flying bird here. If you you know as originally scored. It does not know where it's going in the piano score. There is nothing below it, right? And that isn't a um, that isn't a mistake on the part of a naive young Barvinsky. It is um, it is a an artistic choice. You know, you know we've had these lines just soaring and soaring, and now it's very it's very slowly coming back down to earth. But where it lands, you know, we don't know, right? By giving it context from it's the same thing as here. Right, too much context. Too much context. We're telling this line where to go by adding, by making this go forwards, but by taking out any kind of harmony, <coughs> like the doubling here of the, of the uh, melody in the first violins is fine. Um, this little English horn note here is okay, but I still think you know it's it's unnecessary. Uh, so yeah, so the doubling of the melody is all right. And, and I like the way the English horn comes in here and, and adds on. That's really, really sweet. But just try to get rid of any kind of harmonization in here. Is, it would be my advice. And then I think that the, that the emotional quality of this line becomes ever more potent. All right, wow, this is really turning into a long video. Um, you caught me at a very, in a very talkative mood this morning. Okay, so yeah, Moto Ordinario. I felt that the that this was one of the strongest scorings of of octaves, right? That that would be like if I would say if there's anything about this overall, you know, that maybe needed a bit more work before putting it on the stands. I would say like the you know the treatment of you know of the octave patterns and so on, especially like in the next section. But here, I think that this is really nicely done. Uh, the pizzicato and the harp and everything else. The harp should be marked up to mezzo forte because pizzicato absorbs the sound of the harp, especially in its lower range, like nothing. Right? You could you could score your harp an octave higher, right? And I think you would get a better effect. Yeah, just I just score the harp an octave an octave higher. Don't worry, it's not going to obtrude into what's going on with the melody and the harmony and so on. But yeah, this is really lovely. You, know, you set up a relationship between the oboe and the English horn before. Now they're going to octaves. This is all really great. I love the the second clarinet and bass clarinet coming in here. The treatment of the middle voice. I think this is all great. The uh, first clarinet joining in here and so on. Uh, and flute. Yeah. Just and, and and the way that you do like you go. Crescendo, diminuendo. What's what's the destination? What is the you know how big does that crescendo get? This was this tripped up a lot of people. Um, yeah. So now once again here like two bars crescendo. I think you could say crescendo at the beginning. I don't think you need the dash line, but I think that maybe on the downbeat you could say how how far everybody got and then diminuendo from there. And you might as well just put in a hairpin rather than the word dim, right? Maybe maybe diminuendo makes more sense with the with uh, passages that have a lot of big gaps in them, right? Rather than a hairpin, but this hairpin works. This diminuendo is a little better. Yeah, but hairpins, you know. Yeah, and then the harps or sorry, the horns enter here. So yeah, so I find this perplexing, you know. Da da da, and then here you have da. You know, it's just, it's you waste the chance to go pa pum when you slur right there. Yeah, but I mean, look, other than all those quibbles, you know, 
Um, I don't want to turn this into a big quibble fest. I just really think it's a strong, strong score, Julianne. Um, you know, I was I had the privilege of looking over your scores before, and you know, I really felt that you you know, had a lot of talent, and, and you know, you just really you, you know your development is just getting stronger and stronger. So. Um, so yeah, I I would just say fix it up and see if somebody will play it. Wouldn't it be great if these orchestrations made their way, you know, into little orchestras, community, youth, semi-pro, possibly even some professional orchestras with um, some of our participants showing them around, creating, you know, interest in the music of Ukraine, especially at a time when it really needs a lot of focus and help and so on. Wouldn't that be awesome? So especially like with really deserving scores. This is a deserving score. This this is very near to being the level at which it should just be put on the stands for a reading or a performance or rehearsal. So look into some of those things. See if you can balance out some of those things. See if you can bulk up your octaves a little bit or just make them make them more radiant, you know. And then you have got something that's ready to go. And uh, you should feel really proud about that once it's performed. But, uh, you know, there's nothing really left to say here, but thank you so much, Julianne, for, you know, with, with our other Patreon supporters coming to the rescue of a lot of people in need out there, you know, on the edges of, you know, just of complete desperation. Um, it's just really sad what's happening. So we made a little difference, I guess, you know, but I'm not thinking about that, about us helping them. I'm thinking about them getting help. So thank you for your part in that. I really appreciate it. And thanks for supporting the channel and being a part of the community. It really means a lot. And, um, you know, I hope you'll get a lot of really great comments. I, in fact, I just know <laughs> that people are starting to write them or have already written them. Sometimes people will like listen to the mock-up, you know, look at the score and then make the comment and then later on come back and say, you know, oh, wait, by the way, uh, yeah, Thomas covered what I was saying or, you know, or, or, or they may not. Right? Um, they may go into a complete rundown of, of, um, of your piece according to their perspective. And, um, and that's great. That's great, too. You know, the more people, the more perspectives we get, uh, the more helpful we can be to each other, the better. And that's what makes this a really strong community with everybody helping everybody else. And um, uh, I appreciate how you guys are helping me. Um, that really means a lot, you know, not, and from everybody from Patreon supporters to to my website subscribers to my regular viewers um, who are just, you know, chiming in and and um, and studying these and getting, you know, improving as orchestrators. It all makes us stronger. So thanks, everybody, for all of that. I'll see everybody really soon, a little bit later today with another release of another very cool score. <laughs>